Okay, so I'm going to continue uh, with my second part of the lecture. So remember yesterday I said BSD has two parts. One is the weak BSD, about which you heard more from others who lectured yesterday, which just states that the algebraic rank equals the analytic rank. The analytic rank is nothing but the order of vanishing of the L function, has a L function associated to the elliptic curve, which we define, okay? And remember that the L function incorporates various local data. It is built using local data for, if you are working over Q, then primes for every prime, or if you are working over an arbitrary number field, then the analogs of the primes, which are the valuations or places. So the L function is built out of those information. Okay, whereas the algebraic rank was just something which used the fact that the rational points, that the points of the elliptic curve over any field has a group structure, abelian group structure. And moreover, if it is over a number field, then it is a finitely generated abelian group. So you can talk of the number of free copies of Z and that is the algebraic rank. So today I'm going to talk about the exact formula. So remember you have this LES. And conjecturally, it can be extended to the entire complex plane. It's a function in the complex variable. It can be extended to the entire complex plane as an analytic function. So therefore, from complex analysis, you can think of this as a power series. Around every point, it has a power series expansion. So we'll look at the point S equals 1, and then take the power series expansion of this analytic function in that neighborhood. And because it's a power series, it has the first, it has something, the order, which is the first non-vanishing uh, power, you know. And uh, so take that term, the coefficient of the first non-vanishing term, that's called the leading coefficient. So but the second part of the Birds unit and Dyer formula gives an exact formula for that value of the leading coefficient, okay? But that exact formula so I've written, this is the exact formula. So remember, this is a function of the complex variable, S. We are thinking of it as an analytic function, so therefore a power series expansion in the neighborhood of S equals one. So there, it's going to be a power series, so you know, it'll, it'll have, you know, your Taylor expansion or Taylor Maclaurin, so it'll have A naught plus A one S minus one plus A2, S minus one squared, and so on, right, in that neighborhood. And take the first non-vanishing term. So suppose it's vanishing up to RK. That's the conjecture, that it has to vanish up to RK. So therefore, it will start with A RK, S minus one to the power RK, right? So you divide that L function by S minus one to the power RK. Then it will start with the leading coefficient, AK, ARK. The formula for that, that is this right hand side, the leading coefficient, and the exact formula is given in terms of all this mumbo jumbo. And today in this lecture, I'm going to explain each term that occurs there. All right, so we'll start with the first one. Uh, okay, some of them are very obvious. So now this is the formula, K is again a number field. K is a number field which I recall just means that it's a finite extension of Q. And then uh, E over K is an elliptic curve. And this RK of E, remember, is the algebraic rank. RK of E equals algebraic rank, which just means that E of K, the rational points, K rational points of the elliptic curve, as an abelian group is isomorphic to RK copies of the integers, plus the torsion part, E of K torsion. And this is a finite group, because it's a finitely generated abelian group, and you're looking at the torsion part, so it's finite. And yeah, so this term, you already understand what this is. This is just finite, so this cardinality makes perfect sense, so that term we understand. Now this one, again, for those of you who have done elementary algebraic number theory, you should know that, see, what is a number field? It's an extension of the rationals. So it's a finite extension of the rationals. 
and you want to understand how big it is or you want to measure it somehow with respect to Q. So when you think of it as a vector space, of course, one way of measuring it is its dimension as a vector space. But that is algebraic, whereas you're dealing with arithmetic. So that's the whole um, moral of algebraic number theory. You do algebra, you get some information. But because it's number theory, you get much more finer information if you dig deeper. So one of those invariants associated with k over q, if you just think it's a vector space, then the only thing you can think of is a uh, dimension, and then you hunt for basis, and so on, okay? But remember, these come with additional structures. Just as q has the integers as a discrete part inside q, it's a lattice, right? The function field for z, z is an integral domain, the field of quotients for z is q. These number fields also I mentioned yesterday, they also have something like that. K has a ring of integers which I denoted by OK, which is the analog of Z, and it's an integral domain, and the uh, field of quotients of OK is K, right? So now you use this OK to measure the size of the number field. So that is coded in something called the discriminant of the number field. It's again, those of you who don't know what this is, you pick up any basic book on algebraic number theory. See, by the end of this uh, workshop, if you have at least familiarized yourself with these basic concepts, you should feel good and we will also feel good. Okay, so understand what the discriminant is. There's an explicit formula for the discriminant. What you do is you take an integral basis. So what you do is see you have Z, the field of quotients is Q, and then you have a finite extension, and you have the analog of Z here, which is nothing but the integral closure. Take all the elements which satisfy a polynomial equation, monic polynomial equation over integral coefficients. All elements in K which satisfy a monic polynomial whose coefficients are in Z. We know that every element here satisfies a polynomial equation with coefficients in K. Because this is a finite extension, so it's an algebraic equation, so everything here is, it's algebraic extension, so everything here satisfies an algebraic equation. And because we are working over fields, you can assume that the leading coefficient, that the top coefficient is one. But we are only looking for those elements which satisfy a polynomial whose coefficients are not in Q but are in Z. So collect all those elements. Call that OK. Surprisingly, that set turns out to have a ring structure. And that, when I take the quotient, it's an integral domain even, and when I take the field of quotients of that, I get K. So now therefore, instead of just taking the dimension, which is a very crude invariant, you have something deeper, you have something more refined, the OK. And this OK is used in de defining the discriminant. So you actually choose an integral basis. So you choose a basis, for OK over Z, or you choose a basis for K over Q, but that basis should lie, consist of elements in OK. Okay, and you work with that and you use that to define the discriminant. So of course, as you can all guess, so what do you think should be the discriminant of Q? One, okay? But for this, it's more d d refined. You take a basis, then you build a matrix from that basis, and then you take the determinant of that matrix. That's what is called the discriminant, all right? So therefore, this is an algebraic number theory, one of the most basic things in algebraic number theory. For those of you who don't know this too well, please go back. Or another thing I would, we would strongly, the organizers would strongly encourage you to do is have evening student seminars. So those of you who already know what OK is, one of you please volunteer to lecture to the others so that everybody gets a feeling of what OK is. This is there, you can find any number of resources on the web, you can find it in any basic algebraic number theory, and so on. So please, I really urge you to take, uh, you know, to use the time in the afternoon or in the evening to fill these gaps in your knowledge. Okay, so this term is understood. Now, these are the ones that are different. But let me just give you an idea of um, uh, why 
I mean, the way, at least the way I think about it. So remember, you're working with Q. When you're working with Q, we saw that yesterday. Q has lots of metrics. When you complete with respect to the usual metric, you get, that's the infinity metric. Then you get completion, you get the real numbers. And of course, the real number sits inside the complex numbers. And then, now for k, if I take k, and then of course for q, for every prime p, you have another metric given using the prime p. And then you can complete it, you get what's called qp, the field of periodic numbers. And q is dense in all of this, okay? So somehow, the whole idea in number theory for the last 100 years Q is mysterious. You don't understand the Galois group of Q to this day. But you understand parts of the Galois group using these spaces. The Galois group of each of these fields will be a subgroup of the Galois group of Q. So you don't understand the whole object, but you understand parts of it, subgroups and quotient groups, and then you try and figure out if these pieces of the puzzle, if you put them together, how much of the Galois group of Q can be realized, okay? And now there's something similar for K as well, right? K, I remember K also has what are called places. It has the analogs of this and this. But it, it might not just have one embedding into real or complex numbers. It can have many embeddings, some into reals, few into reals, few into complex numbers. And those embeddings to complex numbers always occur in pairs. If I take one embedding, I have to compose it with the transpose in the algebraic field, and then I get another embedding. And this is true for any field. If I embed any field in complex numbers, I can compose it with the bar operation. And then I, that gives me another embedding. So those embeddings into complex numbers of the algebraic number field come in pairs. And this is, again, something very fundamental. So suppose you have this extension degrees n, and R1 is a cardinality of real embeddings. That is the number of distinct ways in which A lies inside the field of real numbers. And then R2 is the cardinality of complex embeddings. Remember, complex embeddings, for every complex embedding, I have its conjugate, OK? And suppose this extension degree is n, this is another fundamental formula in algebraic number theory, r1 plus 2 r2 is equal to n. And then again, you have for every p, when I take a prime p, at the level of k, I'll have different places sitting on it. There's a precise formula, how many can sit, how they sit, and so on. Again, all these are very basic in algebraic number theory. but for every embedding, I can complete, and then I get an embedding into KV. So I have a bunch of KVs, and I have a bunch of real and complex embeddings. And the Birch, Finite, and Dyer formula is really putting together local information and global information in a very clever way to get global information. So that is the philosophy. At least that's the way I like to think of it. So now, therefore, these are purely global, right? This has nothing local in this. This is global. It only depends on k. Whereas all the others will depend on all those embeddings. So the way I like to think of it, this depends on the complex embedding. This has to do, at least philosophically and in a very, very deep sense, with the complex embedding. This is a mixture of real plus complex, real plus complex embeddings. This is again global plus local. And this is purely local. So now let's look at each of those terms. This is called the period. So let me just write the names and the rest of the time, I'm just going to quickly go through this. These notes will be given to all of you. Um, it's really something I can't do justice to in one hour. I'm just going to give you an indication of what these objects are. 
and how deep and how difficult it is. It's not something that's staring at your face. So that is what is remarkable about the birth unit and I conjecture, you know. It's something very deep. All the terms that come into it don't stare at you in the face saying, take me, take me. You have to dig deep to even understand those terms. And then to put those together and actually come out with a precise formula and to be able to check them for hundreds of thousands of elliptic curves. And then make that conjecture very precise. Okay? So omega e over k, this is called the period of the elliptic curve. Then the regulator, this is called the regulator. And then this symbol, this is called Sha. This is a Russian Cyrillic character. This is called Sha. Or, and this is the tate shafrevich group. And here, every V is a local uh, place, you know? So if you're working, for instance, if K equals Q, you won't have this term. You won't have V's here, you will have QP's, and you'll just have the primes, okay? So uh, CKV, this is called the Tamagawa factor at the place V. Okay, so now let's start with the period. So what is the period? In topology, one of the things, or even in complex analysis, one of the things that you do to find a residue, if it has a pole, or when you're doing complex integration, you integrate a differential along a certain path to get a value, right? To get a complex value, I mean Cauchy integral, you can integrate it along various paths. So this is something you can do more generally when you do differential manifolds, for instance. Even there in Diram theory, if you have done topology and if you have done Diram uh, complexes and so on, to see that the Betty cohomology and Diram cohomology are related. See, Diram cohomology consists of something like D somethings. Betty cohomology, the right way to think of them is actually paths, right? It's related, H1 for instance. If you think of Betty cohomology H1, it's nothing but a quotient of pi 1. And what is pi 1? Pi 1 is just loops. And what you can do in abstract topology, abstract differential topology, given a differential form, you can integrate it along various paths on that space to get values. Where those values lie, all that depends on the field you're choosing and so on. Here, we are going to, so when I say complex, see this information really encodes the nature of the points of the elliptic curve over the complex numbers. So what you do is, you pick You pick, uh, you pick this differential here. It was done yesterday. I think Sudhanshu spoke about it. Um, yeah, remember, yesterday I already mentioned to you that over the complex numbers, any elliptic curve, this group, you can abstractly think of it as Z mod lambda, where lambda is a lattice. Okay? And uh, let me skip all this, but omega E, I want to show you what omega E is. Yeah, omega E is here, see this differential. For the Birch, Minute and Dyer formula to work, it's very important that you take the right differential and so on. So remember you had a Weierstrass form, and there you had those coefficients A1, A3, and so on. So the, P, the uh, differential form that you're going to be choosing is dx plus two over 2y plus A1x plus A3. Okay, given a differential form on any complex manifold. Okay, now you think of this E of C. Remember I said topologically you can think of it as a torus. So you can think of it as a complex manifold. And in any complex manifold, if you are given a differential form, you can integrate it along paths. 
or along loops. So what you do is, on the other hand, because you just think of this as a topological space, therefore it has a Betty cohomology, H1, E of Z, Z. And the right way to think of this is really as paths on the complex manifold. And given any path here, you can integrate this differential form along that path to get a complex number. So you look at integral of omega, let me call this omega e, because this a1, e3 really depend on the elliptic curve, right? They are the coefficients coming in the Weierstrass equation. So integrate that omega e along all the paths gamma, where gamma are elements in h1, e, c, z. In fact, you don't even need to integrate it along all of them. There are two chosen paths. It's enough if you integrate along those and take the complex subspace generated by that. For instance, if you think of this as a torus, then there is one path here and another path here. Right? Those two somehow are the key ones. And you can just integrate this differential along those two paths. You'll get two complex numbers. Then take the complex abelian group generated by those. Take the abelian group generated by those. That's the uh, set of periods. Um, oh, sorry, that, that will give you the lattice, in fact. Okay? The lattice is, in fact, this lattice, once I do this for these two paths and I take the Z abelian group generated by those two values, I get the lattice lambda. So lambda is nothing but Z generated by integral of omega e. I take the abelian subgroup generated by all these periods, then I get back the lattice. Okay, so this omega e, you can see it's playing a very complex role. It has algebraic geometric value, it has differential geometric value, it has value in complex analysis, topological value, everything. Okay, so that's why I like to think of the uh, period as uh, something coming from the complex embedding. You see, a priori, we know nothing about the value of the complex L function. We know nothing. The values could, what are they? Is it, how do we know that it's not identically zero? Or how do we know that it takes values in Q or algebraic integers? It could be transcendental. We know nothing about, just as we know nothing about the values of the Riemann zeta function. Right? Conjecturally, you know a lot of things. Right? But actually, you know very little about the values of the Riemann zeta function. So it's something similar even here. Anyway, so that is the period. Okay, this is a transcendental value. For all you know, it's a transcendental number. It's some number, if you're working over Q, it's some number in complex in C. If you are working over an algebraic number field, it's something in K. Okay? And then now let, let's come to uh, the next one, the regulator. Okay, the next thing I'm doing is low, over local field. So let's come to the other one here. So we'll next talk about these Tamagama, Tamagama factors. So to do this, what you need to do, what you are looking at really is value, uh, there are a group of rational points of the elliptic curve over uh, kv. So for every place, you can complete and then take the rational points there and of course it contains e of k. Again, you know nothing, you know that this is a finitely generated abelian group. What do you know about this? It's definitely not gen finitely generated as an abelian group, but you do have results which tell you what this group looks like and so on. But we will not get into that. What I really need is the following. Yeah, so you see, because now these KVs, like I said yesterday, remember these KVs are very special. They have a ring of integers. KV has a ring of integers OV, and KV is nothing but OV invert pi V. Pi V is the generator, OV is a local ring, 
So it has a maximal ideal MV and a residue field KV, which is OV mod MV. And MV is principal. I take any greater and call that pi V. That's a parameter. So now you're digging deeper and you have so much more information. And therefore you exploit that. So what you know is over a local field, every elliptic curve with suitable change of coordinates, you can generate something called the minimal Weierstrass equation. Okay? See, a general elliptic curve has a formula like this. That's the Weierstrass equation. But you can keep making change of variables and eventually land up with some equation. What property do you want of this equation? Remember, for every equation, we had the discriminant, the value of the discriminant delta. What you can do is now, because this OV is a local ring, it's in fact a discrete valued ring. So what it means is that there is in fact a formula, a, a function V from KV to Z union infinity. What property does this have? V of pi V is one, V of zero is infinity, and V of uh, any element in OV, V of X is greater than or equal to zero for X in OV. Okay, so these, this is called a discrete valuation. And V of AB equals V of A plus V of B. So it has these properties. So now therefore, because you have a way of somehow associating a value to every element of KV, I want to make a change of variables for the local, when I look at the elliptic curve over a local field, I want to make change of variables and arrange that the discriminant, remember the delta that we had, the discriminant is going to change each time you have a change of variables because it depends on those coefficients. I want to arrange that the discriminant has minimal value for V. Okay, and it's a theorem. Again, it's a deep theorem that you can do it. So that is a minimal equation given a minimal Weierstrass, and then that corresponding equation, you call that the minimal Weierstrass equation. You do that. So that's what is explained here. So from now on, I'm going to assume that when I'm working with the elliptic curve over a local field, I'm working with a minimal Weierstrass equation. And then you see, uh, given we can reduce its coefficients. Now what is the property? So once you have, again, now all these coefficients in the minimal Weierstrass equation are going to be integral. They are going to be in OV, in the ring of integers. So therefore, again, I can reduce modulo the maximal ideal, just as we did for Z, right? Z we went modulo P to get reduced equations, to get elliptic curves over FP. So I can do the same thing for the local field. So therefore, I'll get a reduced equation E tilde. That's called a reduction. And I get a natural map E of K to E tilde of K, which is again called a reduction. Even at the level of points, you can get it. Once you, uh, roughly what it is, is you think of a point of the elliptic curve over the local field. It's going to be something because it's OV invert pi V. Just think of Q in the simplest sense. If you look at a point on E of Q, it's going to be a bunch of rational numbers. X coordinate, Y coordinate, Z coordinate. I can clear denominators because I'm allowed to multiply in projective coordinates, I'm allowed to multiply by a scalar. So I'll clear denominators and I can assume that these coordinates are actually integers. And then once they're integers, I can go modulo any prime P. So I can imitate the same thing even for OV. So therefore, that gives the map, but that's the miracle. Once you do that, it's not difficult to see because you're just reducing the elliptic curve as well. Once I do that on this side, I get a point on the reduced elliptic curve. Okay? So this is called a reduction map. But now again, remember, yesterday we had this discussion. Once you reduce, that elliptic curve could be singular. It need not, you know, it can have a node or it can have, um, 
cusp, you know. So depending on that, you give it different names, good reduction, bad reduction, exactly as I explained yesterday for Q. So now, so for instance, if it has a cusp or if it has a node, so these are singular points. But then I look at all the points here which land in the non-singular part of the reduced curve. So your reduced curve need not be smooth. It will, but it will have some singularities. It will have some smooth points, it will have some singularities. So I look at all the points in E of k which map to non-singular points when I reduce them. So that's E tilde ns of k. This denotes the set of non-singular points of E tilde of k. In particular, if E has good reduction, then the entire reduced curve consists only of non-singular points. If it has bad reduction, then there are two possibilities. If you don't understand this, don't bother. This is just the analog of, uh, uh, you know, the node and the, uh, this one. But all of these you can explicitly describe in terms of the valuation on the discriminant. So remember, you have this delta associated to the elliptic curve. You can find out what kind of a reduction that curve has by looking at the value. For every place, you have a value. By looking at this V of delta, this encodes some information on the kind of reduction that the elliptic curve has at V. So this, for those of you again who know a little bit of algebraic number theory, one of the fundamental questions is you have Q, you have K, and then you have a prime P here. But above that, you have lots of places. Now, it can ramify, it can remain a prime, or it can split. These are the possibilities that can happen. And how do you, measure, how do you know the first level of information, whether a prime ramifies or unramifies, is given by measuring whether the prime divides the discriminant or not of the number field. So this is somehow a generalization of that. So the valuation of the discriminant encodes information of the kind of reduction, okay? So that is explained here. And now, so you see, now uh, depending on the kind of reduction, you have two subtypes, split multiplicative, non-split multiplicative. Again, this is technical, I don't want to go into it. But you can look at, I define two subsets. So remember, I first defined E tilde of Non, the non-singular part of the reduced curve. Then I'm looking at those points, global points, which go to non-singular points. Among those, I'll further divide them into two kinds. One I'll call E0 of k. These are all the points which go to the non-singular part. And E1 are those which go to the trivial element on the reduced curve. In other words, the kernel of the reduction map. Okay? So that is E0 and E1. And this is a proposition. Again, all of these are deep, you know, it's not, it's not difficult. But it's not something that's staring you at the face, saying you do this, you do this, and so on. You have to dig to get these groups. So each of these sets, E0 of k, E1 of k, E tilde non-singular of k, they have a group structure. E1, it's obvious because it's a kernel of a homomorphism. But E0 is not so obvious, but it still does have a group structure, and they are all subgroups of E of k. And we have an exact sequence like this. E1 of k, by definition, it's uh, those that go to the trivial element in the reduced curve. So the Tamagawa number of E over k is defined as the index E of k, E0 of k. Okay, this index, E of k, E0 of k, that's called the Tamagawa number. Of course, here k is misleading. I should really put a kv. I'm assuming k is a local field here. So it's really uh, kv. K is a number field, KV is a local field, and so CKV of E is this index, E of KV, E naught of KV. And there's this important theorem by Codera and Neron, uh, which says if you take an elliptic curve, if it has split multiplicative reduction, then the size of this group is of this order, the, disc the valuation of the discriminant. Forget this J, this J is invariant, I didn't explain what it is. In all other cases, this is group is finite and has order at most four. So that explains this factor here. And remember, this is a finite product. Why is it a finite product? Because for most of the places V, the elliptic curve will have good reduction. So the Tamagawa factor will be 1. Why will it have good reduction? 
it can have bad reduction at most at the places which divide the discriminant. So therefore, this is a finite product. Okay, so we have explained this, we have explained this, so the last two terms. Now the regulator is something that mixes the real and complex embeddings. Now we did this and, oh yeah. So this actually, this is slightly difficult to explain. Let me see what I can do, how best I can. Yeah, okay. So now I'll just be very brief on this because I mean this will take a whole lecture by itself. And again, this is one of the things which you can do amongst yourself. You know, you go to Silverman, learn more about heights and lecture it to yourselves. So basically, in, in fact, in all of arithmetic geometry and in, in general in geometry itself, in algebraic geometry, once you have points and once you have points over special fields, let's say, C, R, K, V, all of these are not ordinary fields. They have more information. The complex number has an absolute value. It has a transpose map. The real field also has an absolute value. The uh, local fields have a valuation. So they all come with additional structure. So you use this additional structure to somehow understand the solutions. And this need not be just for elliptic curves. For instance, you can take solutions of any equation, any algebraic equation, over the complex numbers or over the local fields and so on. And then you want to understand the size of these solutions. After all, Birch, Winnet and Dyer conjecture is partly about understanding how big is the set of solutions. But to do that, what you also do is estimate, give some quantity which will estimate the size of each solution. If you, if you want, in a class, in a big class, there are two ways. One, the big measurement is to measure the number of students in the class. But then you can do finer measurements. How many of them are taller than 130 centimeters? How many of them are taller than 100 centimeters? How many of them are over 60 kgs? How many of them are over 40 kgs? Right? So it's something like that that you're doing to the set of solutions. First, you want to measure the global size of the set of solutions. And inside that, you want a way of estimating a size of each solution. How big is a solution? Which in principle you can do because these fields themselves have a way of measuring the size of the elements there. So you use that and that was first defined by Neron Tate. There are various ways. First, in fact, it started with a very simple thing of just taking the maximum. If you're working over Q, just take the maximum of the size of the numerator or the size of the denominator of the solutions. That's one way of estimating. That was refined further and further, and there's something called the Neron Tate height. Okay? And uh, on the number field, it's a little complicated to explain. I mean, it's not difficult, it's just that we'll need longer time. But all you should remember is that the Neron Tate height gives you a way of measuring the size of a solution. And typically, the first advances that were made, what is the importance of having an estimate like this? If you want to show that the set of solutions is finite, then you show that the equations in the set of equations, uh, sorry, in the set of solutions for that equation, you can never find an element which is larger than some given size. And then you show that everything which is smaller than that size is finite. So therefore, now the set of your solutions has to be finite, cardinality. So that's the way the height was used. And it is still used, it's a very important notion, the height. In arithmetic geometry, algebraic geometry, measuring how large the set is. If you like, the closest analog is the prime number theorem, you know. Prime number theorem, you're estimating the number of primes less than or equal to a given number x. Right, the value pi of x. So this, yeah. Correct, yes. But I'm assuming quadratic uh, characteristic is not 2. Yeah, but uh, the way they define h is something they are defining to the height of the elliptic curve. Height of the, height of the elliptic curve doesn't make sense. Height of, points in an ellipt height of points in an elliptic curve makes sense. So anyway, all I want you to remember is there's something called the Neron Tate height, okay? Which uh, you can then use, so that's the height function. 
it's a canonical height. Just go one level higher. So you see, so this is the theorem. H hat is the canonical height. So first you define something called H. Okay, actually it's not too difficult. Maybe I can just run through it quickly. So you go to K bar. Okay, and K bar, you know, it's a projective curve, so it's given here. So you have the naive height, you take a point, and then you just use H1 of F of P. F of P, this capital H is just the maximum of log X naught XV. It's some way of measuring using the additional structures that these fields have. So you first define the naive height, and then the canonical height or the Nerontate height is a function H hat from the points on the elliptic curve into zero infinity, it doesn't take the value infinity, and it's this limit. Remember, this makes sense because it has an abelian group structure, so once I take a point, I can take two to the, I can keep doubling that point. Two times p, four times p, I keep doing it, and I take the limit of this. This is a well-defined object, and then it has the following properties, okay? And then this is zero if and only if it's a torsion point. So you see, that's why this is a valid um, way of measuring. It neglects all the torsion points. All the torsion points are small because its Nerontate height is zero. So if you want your set of solution to be large, you better find a point which has non-zero Nerontate height. Right? Because all the torsion points are going to have Nerontate height zero. So if you want your E of K to be infinite, you better find a point whose Nerontate height is not zero. And, uh, and in fact, this is used crucially in the proof. Remember I said model way theorem, that the set of elliptic curves, uh, solutions over a number field is a finitely generated abelian group. You prove that using the Nerontate height. And then you can in fact use this canonical height to give a quadratic form. So you evaluate it on two points, h hat of p plus q minus h hat of p minus h hat of q. Now this is a bilinear symmetric form, right? If I change Q and P, I still get the same value, right? Because I still get Q plus P minus H hat of Q minus H hat of P. So I get the same value. That's what is meant by bilinear. And so it has this property and various other properties that I mentioned. And therefore, upshot, the final uh, thing is that this canonical height extends to define a positive definite quadratic form on the vector, vector space E of k tensor r. This is a real vector space. And on that vector space, you have a quadratic form. Positive definite. Positive definite means it just takes positive values. And a quadratic form, remember on a vector space, a real valued quadratic form, if I have a vector space, real vector space, it's just a function from here to here such that it has a property if lambda is a scalar, Q of lambda V is lambda squared Q of V. And because the characteristic is not two, you can always go from a quadratic form to a bilinear form. Again, those of you who don't know this, please look up any basic book on quadratic forms and see how you use the property that the characteristic is not two to go from symmetric bilinear forms to quadratic forms. Okay? Anyway, so ultimately you get this bilinear form and then you define this bilinear form using the Nerontate height. A quadratic form gives rise to a bilinear form, so this is just the bilinear form got from this quadratic form. It's an even function, you get a bilinear form and therefore you get a quadratic form gives a bilinear form and the regulator is de defined as this determinant. So what you do is you take the points, go modulo the torsion points, then by the model way theorem, we know that we get a free abelian group, right? Because it's a finitely, this is a finitely generated abelian group. So it has a free part and a torsion part. I'm killing the torsion part, so I only have the free part. It's a free Z module. So once I have a free Z module, I can take a basis, a Z basis. And then I apply P i P j, I take the Nerontate height pairing for the basis elements. Then I get an R cross R matrix, bilinear form, so it, I get a, by a symmetric matrix. I take the determinant of that. Yeah. That gives the regulator. That's called the regulator. So the regulator in some sense is measuring a certain volume. 
Okay, it's measuring a volume of some fundamental thing associated with the lattice. Okay, so that's the regulator. And this is an important corollary that the regulator is always positive. Okay, so that explains this term. So that leaves us with this last term. This was already touched upon by um, Sudanshu yesterday, but uh, I still have 14 minutes, right? Yeah. So let's spend some more time on this. So any questions so far on all of these? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Um, right, okay. So then, uh, yeah, this is the Selma group and the Tate-Shafrevich group. See, that is what, again, this is the last part of the Birds, Minute and Dyer conjecture. In fact, there's a very famous quote. I don't think I have the quote here, but I, I don't remember who said it, but uh, does anybody remember that quote? What is marvelous about the Birds, Minute and Dyer conjecture is it takes conjectural quantities, unknown quantities, which are themselves mysterious, and build something very precise about them. What are the mysterious things so far? We don't know that this is an analytic function. So we don't know if this sign makes full sense, except when k is q, and that's a very deep theorem. And in general, you believe that the left-hand side makes sense. On the right-hand side, okay, so far everything makes sense. None of these this, 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 all of this makes sense. There's no ambiguity. It's all very clear, but you have had to work very hard and it's very deep. You have had to understand the nature of the points of the elliptic curve over real fields, over co complex, over local fields, structure of local fields, all that. You have used non-trivial amount of um, algebraic number theory already, okay? But now comes the biggest surprise. This is a total mystery. You can define it, you can define it very precisely, no problem about that. But it is conjectured to be finite. It's a group, I'll define that group again, and it's conjectured to be finite. Nobody knows that, to this day you don't know that it's finite. You have examples of elliptic curves where it is finite. And in fact, there's a, it's true, um, Tate apparently believed that this would be the simplest thing to prove. The finiteness of this group would be very easy to prove. It, it's something like the local, local global principle. I'll explain why it is something like the local global principle. And he didn't think that it should be too difficult to prove. He thought that should be very easy to prove. But he couldn't prove it. And then Birds, Winnet and Dyer conjecture, they conjectured it is finite and came up, went about predicting this exact formula. And in all the numerical examples they could check, assuming that this was finite. So the way it went was they could compute this, they could compute all of this, but they didn't know this was finite. So they ended up computing this. Okay, this gives a, if you believe that it is finite and you know all the other quantities, then you get a value for this. Right? And then, if it is finite, then it has a certain cardinality. Then they went about analyzing, okay, this is the power of two that divides it. So it's a group of order 12. So it should have, the two part is four at the most. So it should have an element of order three. And then they went about checking that painfully. The first example, the birth unit and I conjecture was made sometime in the 60s, 1960s. The first concrete example of an elliptic curve where you could show that the whole tate shafrevich group was finite, was due to Rubin, again uses very deep methods, and it happened only after the mid-80s. So forget it in its entire generality. Even to get one example of an elliptic curve, where you know that the tate shafrevich group is finite, took 25 years after they proved, uh, after they came up with the conjecture. Okay? 
So till then you only had, you could measure, if it is finite, then it has, it's a finite abelian group. So you have its two primary torsion, three primary torsion, five primary torsion, etc., etc., etc. So those were the kind of calculations they could make. And the first example where you actually explicitly computed the whole Tay-Shafrevich group happened only in the 80s, late 80s, after mid 80s. So let's talk about the Tay-Shafrevich group. So I'm going to erase all this now. Sudanshu, so already yesterday he gave you one definition of the Tate-Shafrevich group. I'm going to write that. Shaw of E over K equals kernel of H1 Galois group of K bar over K, E of K bar, so H1 product over all the primes, H1 Galois group, KV bar over KV, E of KV bar. Okay? So now let me explain each term in this again. And then I will tell you why this is a kind of local global principle. And that will be the end of my lectures. So now what is this here? So this again, Sudansha explained. Let M be any abelian group, a G module. G is a group. M is a G module. What does this mean? This just means that M is an abelian group. M has an addition. Independently, it's an abelian group. But apart from that, there is an action of G on M. G M goes to G dot M. Which, because it's an action, it should satisfy G1, G2 acting on M should be the same as G1 acting on G2 of M. And then the identity element does nothing. This is just M for all the elements. And any action respects the addition in M. OK, this is how a group acts on M. This is meant by, a, it's a G module. Or what is the same? This is the same as saying that M is a ZG module. You form the group ring of G over Z. That's a ring. So you can talk of modules over that ring. So M is a ZG module. So these are two equivalent definitions. And once you have this G modules, you can define two, I mean, you can define, in fact, you can put any N here. You can define a whole series of cohomology groups. Again, which, are, which came from topology and so on. It's very interesting. Huh? Uh, but we'll only consider the first 0 and 1. And what is the simplest example? Where can you think of something like this? Example, G is the Galois group of a field, Galois group of K bar over K. And M can be K bar or K bar star. K bar star means all the non-zero elements of K bar. So then, of course, the Galois group is acting on elements of K bar. And it follows all this loss. So that's a natural example of a G module. And then once you have a G module, you can define the zero cohomology group. In fact, you have HIGM for I greater than or equal to zero. These are all abelian groups. And, but we don't need them. We'll only need zero and one where you can give a very explicit definition. So what is H naught of G of M? H naught of G of M consists of all the elements of M which are not affected by the action. For every element in the group, the action does nothing. It just leaves it undisturbed. So for instance, if you come back to this situation, the Galois group acting on K bar, these are called the fixed points. What are the fixed points? The fixed points are just K by the definition of the Galois group. Okay? 
and then H1 of GM. So now, because you are dealing with two groups, you have G is a group, M is a group. G need not be abelian, but it's a group nevertheless. So you have two groups, you can talk about homomorphisms between those groups. Right? And this H1 consists of what are called crossed homomorphisms. So a crossed homomorphism is a map function f from g to m. It's not a homomorphism. But in a very precise way, it fails to be a homomorphism. So what is that precise way? It satisfies the following, such that f of g1, g2 is equal to g1, f of g2 plus f of g1. So it fails only because this g1 comes up here. If the g1 was not here, it would just be f of g2 plus f of g1 and it would be a homomorphism. Or if the group action was trivial. So you say that the group acts trivially if g dot m is equal to m for every g in g and for every m in m. It does nothing. g just acts as the identity. g dot m is equal to 1 dot m equals m for every g in g and for every m in m. Then you say it's a trivial action. Okay? So if g were acting trivially on m, then g1 times f of g2, this g1 is just a dummy, it's not doing anything, so I could just forget it. And it would be f of g2 plus f of g1, and it will be a homomorphism. So it somehow fails to be a homomorphism because of a non-trivial action. Okay? Now what are some examples of, why do you know that such things exist? Why should, I mean, I'm just writing something, why should there ever be a homomorphism like that? That is because you can, for every m in m, I can define objects like this. I can define fm from g to m by fm of g equals gm minus m. This makes sense, right? Because gm is again an element in m, and m after all has an abelian group structure, so gm minus m makes sense. Exercise, check that this has this property. So therefore, there are examples of these. But I somehow want to forget these examples. So I take all these crossed homomorphisms. So these are all, I'm going to denote them by Z1 GM. These are crossed homomorphisms. F belongs to Z1 GM if it satisfies this. And these are crossed boundaries, or these are boundaries which come from elements in M crossed homomorphisms which are somehow coming from the group M. Those are boundaries. Both of these are groups, abelian groups. So I can talk of Z1 GM mod B1 GM. And this is by definition H1 GM. So it is only represented by a class of such crossed homomorphisms. I am allowed to take a crossed homomorphism and add or subtract a boundary to get an element in H1, okay? So this is an abelian group and this is H0 and H1. And of course, so therefore this side you understand now. So what is an element there? I can think of an element there. I can think of an element here. I just take a class represented by F. So it's really a map from here to here. So F I can think of as an element as a crossed homomorphism from the Galois group to E of k bar. Remember that E of k bar is also a, a, equipped with a Galois action. We mentioned this yesterday. So E of k bar is a G module, is a Galois module. And I take all homo, I take a crossed homomorphism like this. It's just a crossed homomorphism. And that's an element here. And what is this map? So for every V, I mentioned this, and those of you who don't know this, again, this is something basic in algebraic number theory, you should figure it out. This Galois group sits inside the big Galois group. And this is smaller than the completed field, so this sits inside E of k bar V. So taking a crossed homomorphism here, I can compose it with the inclusion on both sides, and then I get an Fv. 
restriction. And it's not difficult at all to check that that is still a crossed homomorphism. This part is clear, right? Because this is just action, and here this is a subgroup. So you're just restricting the action to that subgroup. So that's not difficult at all to see. So that is this natural map. And I do it for all of them. And I take the kernel of this map. So that means I'm looking at crossed homomorphisms here, which become boundaries here locally. OK? Now this has another more interesting and easy, easy, quote unquote, easy way to imagine it, which is why it's called a local global principle. And that's the following. This set, H1, G, E, it actually classifies Oh, I'm sorry. I'll just keep Shah because I've explained all the others. So H1, G, Galois group of K bar over K, E of K bar. I'm just going to write this as H1, G, E. This is a group. It has a group structure. But you can think every element here has more structure. So if I take an element, psi, in H1, G, E, one way of thinking of it is, like I said, this cross product, crossed homomorphism, class of a crossed homomorphism. But in fact, this H1, G, E classifies what are called forms of E. What do I mean by this? What does this mean? This means that it classifies curves. Curves defined over k. In other words, it's an explicit equation which defines in two variables, if you're looking at the plane part, defines an equation in two variables, coefficients in k, such that curve let's say C, such that when I look at C of K bar, it becomes isomorphic as a group to E of K bar. Not just that, but this is a curve defined over K. And in an algebraic geometric sense, because K is contained in K bar, I can extend scalars and view it as a curve defined over K bar. And as a curve defined over k bar, it is isomorphic to the elliptic curve defined over k bar. So the k bar, they become undistinguishable. You can't distinguish between them. But over k, they are two different entities. And this happens only because c of k is empty. If c of k is non-empty, then already over k, CK becomes isomorphic to E of K, EK, and C of K becomes isomorphic to E of K. So of course there's one obvious element. When you think of it as forms of E, there is one obvious element here. When you think of it as a curve, which is that element? E itself. E itself is there. E is defined over K. E is isomorphic to E over K bar more. It's isomorphic to E even over K. So that E is the trivial element in this group. And any curve, if it has a point over K, then it's already E. So the only reason it is not E over K, but becomes E over K bar is because it doesn't have a point. It might become E over a finite extension. Always it does. It might acquire a point. It always acquires a point once you go to a finite extension of k. Already over that finite extent, extension, c and e are indistinguishable. OK, so that's called forms of e. So another way of thinking of this kernel, therefore, so therefore, sha of e over k, you can also think of it 
as all curve C, curve over K, defined over K, such that C K bar is isomorphic, first property to the elliptic curve over K bar. Second, C of K V bar is not empty because it goes to the kernel. So it's going to E to the trivial element here, which is the elliptic curve over the local field. And I said that can happen only when it has a point. Sorry, not CKV bar. CKV is not empty. Right? So this classifies curves. The only reason they are not elliptic curves is because they don't have a point. Remember, elliptic curves come with this God-given point. And these forms don't have a point over that rational field. But they have a point locally. When you go to this much larger local field, then locally everywhere they have a point. But globally they don't have a point. That's why it's a local global principle. Locally they have points, but globally they don't have points. This is in total contrast to what we saw in the hasse minkowski glo local global principle. Remember a quadratic form. Quadratic form is nothing but an equation in two variables. There, the moment it has proper uh, points locally, it has to have a point globally. But for elliptic curves, that's not the case. And the failure of that is captured by the tate shefflewich group. It's conjectured to be finite, you will get a million dollars even if you prove that it's finite or not finite. Okay? And so that explains the exact formula. And most of these are, like I said, computable. You can just go type uh, on the programs. It will give you all those values. Can compute the right-hand side, compute the left-hand side, at least the p parts of it. So for instance, if you want to measure the two part of the Swinnerton and Dyer conjecture. So you can look at the left-hand side, the L value, the two part of it. On the right-hand side, you have lots of examples where the two part of the tate shefrevich group is finite. The two primary torsion part of it is finite. So substitute those values, the two primary part, and you'll see that the both of them are equal. They match up. And you can do it for three, par, three primary, and I think you can go up to five, seven, and so on. Now there are huge numbers of computations. So just play around with it. It's really miraculous to see each of those values being computed and how neatly they fit and both sides match up. Okay, so I'll stop here and any question, we can take a few questions. Sorry? SHA-2? No, no, yes, of course, you can define SHA-2 for everything, right? You can define these Galois, these and these. You don't need to, you can go only up to two, okay? Three, these groups vanish. And SHA-3 is, in fact, you can show that SHA-3 is zero. You know that. That's all, in class field theory already, you come up with all this. SHA-2, you can define it, and there's even a duality between SHA-1 and SHA-2. There's a perfect pairing between SHA-1 and SHA-2 and so on. So lots of things are known, but not finiteness. For Sha? No, like the curves. No, it's not a modelized space. It has no algebraic structure. I mean, the only as a algebraic geometric structure. Let me put it that way. Sorry, what was the reason for guessing that the? Maybe. I, I really don't know. I mean, they just, class number formula was the original, this one. But there's no analog of Shah in the class number formula as such. Okay? And I really don't know. It's, it's, uh, it's like Ramanujan's mathematics. I, but though, I mean, you speak to uh, Birch, Swinnerton and Dyer, they're all alive. You talk to them, they just say that they were guided by one intuition, then the numerical values which were, you know, they were constantly testing on the computer, right? The photograph of which you saw yesterday, that one. And then they were more inspired by, um, uh, I'm forgetting the other word, you know, which Deline proved. 
Oh, what's that? Way conjectures. They were inspired by the way conjectures to come up with this exact formula. That's how they say it. And in fact, this, this H1, they give it a more geometric meaning related to the class, uh, classical objects in class number uh, th theory, you know. So it's there in Cohomology Galvazian, this book by Serre. If you look at it, he has one chapter on other ways of thinking about H1 and so on. Of course, he has this way, forms of elliptic curve, but he also talks a little more about that. Um, also, Lichtenbaum has general cohomological. But all no, no, but Lichtenbaum were all later, right? They were. No, I'm saying uh, general cohomological set of all this formula you can put, like one, two, 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 three, three, three. Right, right, yeah, exactly, yeah. Now, but what, what is the most. Uh, yeah, this, okay, on the other hand, you can ask, why did, why should they have, why should have Tate thought that this Sha should be finite, when it has been so notoriously difficult to prove? For that, there's an answer. You see, this elliptic curve is a projective object. It's an abelian group, plus, as a geometric structure, it's a projective object. It lies in projective space. So it's a projective abelian group. On the other hand, you have affine algebraic groups. Right? The matrices GLN, SLN, all of these are algebraic groups. And you can ask the same question. All you need is a group here and a Galva action. So I can ask these for abelian group, uh, algebraic groups, non-abelian even. Even for non-abelian things, you can define this H1, SLN, K star. You know, you have lots of K bar star. K bar star, that's Hilbert theorem 90, it tells you that that vanishes, H1 vanishes. But I can look at GM and other algebraic groups and ask exactly the same question. You have forms for algebraic groups, meaning you have varieties which over the ground field have a group structure, they are defined over K, but they become isomorphic to the algebraic group only over K bar. So you have forms for those. Then that was measured. That kernel was measured for affine objects. And in many cases, it was trivial. And therefore, Tate thought, OK, affine to projective. In the affine case, it's trivial. The kernel is even 0. And so in the projective case, it can maybe be at most finite. Okay, so nobody to this day believes that Shah can be infinite. It is finite, but it's just that, just this shift from affine to projective just changes the nature completely. Already the proof that in the affine case, the kernel is trivial, it's non-trivial to prove. It's not impossible. But because they are affine algebraic groups, you have other ways of interpreting them. Like one of the ways would be typically something, you know, you have k, okay? So typically you have k, let's say k and q. And then for every v, you have kv and qp. So one of the ways when you're working with affine things, one of the trivial translations of this problem of the understanding this kernel is, suppose I have an x here. and Suppose, not there, here, Q. And then I embed it in QP for every P. And then suppose locally it's a norm. Then is there a global element such that this is also a norm globally? This is again a local global question, right? An element, you start with an element in K, push it locally into every completion, locally it becomes a norm. Then is there a global element such that even globally it's a norm? So typically when you work with affine algebraic groups, it translates to such problems, field theory problems. And then you find out that if it's globally a norm, locally a norm, it has to be globally a norm, and therefore the kernel is trivial and so on in special cases. But the minute you go to elliptic curve or abelian varieties, it's... Uh, you don't have those tools at all, you know, because it's just forms, you have no additional structure to work with. Uh, 